located in two places like Tel Aviv. Great software. Seriously, that's all you got? Yeah. <laughs> Are we ready? Do we want to back into that? You can use DNA. Boy, those robots look cool performance. Hi, um, thanks for coming. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some kind of, maybe you are using Ruby and maybe you've reached kind of a point where Ruby becomes difficult or maybe you just kind of want to look, see what, el what else is out there, go check everything out. Um, so I'm going to go over a couple of things. But first, before I do that, I want to talk for a second about um, my clicker not working about this, about Moore's Law. So Moore's Law says that about every two years, um, technology doubles in speed. And um, what ended up happening is back, if you look at, um, wh where? Here, I got this, this thing's working. Um, you have this line right here, which is CPU speed. This is kind of an old graph. So around 2002, three, it looks like, we kind of leveled off on chips getting faster, um, which, is kind of not awesome. So what ended up happening was the, the, the wires and the transistors got so tiny, um, they're actually saying that in the next time, sometime in the, in the near future, these wires will be like 10 atoms across. So if you can just like try to picture what, I guess you can't because you just see a graph of the weird balls that are. Um, but that's how tiny they are. So the problem is that when you, have something that small, you need to give it more electricity to make it more kind of um, accurate. So you need to give it more power. And when you give it more and more power, you end up with your computers catching on fire. So they had to, instead of um, doing this faster and faster chips, there's more and more, there's more, and more cores in the processes. So I was at Yuruko, um, what year was it, 2015? And uh, Matt's gave a talk about kind of maybe the future of concurrency with Ruby. He talked about a lot of different things, um, some interesting things. Um, he talked about the, the, the gill a little bit. Um, if you're not familiar with the gill, it's something that makes it so only one um, Ruby thread can be processing at the same time or one system level um, processor. You can only use one processor at a time. I'm really good at describing things. I should really be talking in front of a group of people. Um, so th the reason that Matt's y implemented the gill was because he wanted to be, he wanted developers to be happy. He wanted to see people I I creating C extensions to kind of have an easier time with it. So in that, they give up this kind of being able to have multiprocessor Ruby without using fork. Um, Matt himself said that threading is very, very hard. Um, it's true. And the problem with this is, is that we live in this, I'm going to kill this thing. We live in this, um, this world where we, our processes aren't getting any faster. We need to split this up. And Ruby isn't solving that problem right now. And it looks like it won't be solving that problem for the next, or at least till the end of the decade. I don't even know what that really means. Maybe till 2020. Um, so I came out of the talk, and someone comes up to me, and they're like, hey, dude, um, what do you think of that talk that you just heard? And I kind of overreacted a little bit. But since then, I've kind of re relaxed a bit more. And I am trying to. I probably spend like 20% of my time now writing Elixir. So I'm kind of moving in that direction. But I still use Ruby a lot, and I really, really enjoy it. Um, the more programming language that I've learned, the more the different, I, th I can think of things, different solutions to problems that I would have never thought about before. Um, and I can now reach for the correct tool for the job instead of just being like, I'm a Rubyist and I use Ruby to solve my problems. I'm gonna talk about three pro programming languages in particular. I'm gonna talk about Go, the Elixir programming language, and a l programming language called Crystal. This isn't going to be super, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in each of these languages. Um, if you want more detail, we're going to do a workshop tomorrow at some point, 1.30 or something like that. Um, 
And I'm not really sure what the format is going to be. I think it might be kind of what do you guys want to learn about? What is the most interesting to you? Um, and then people can say, oh, the concurrency model of Elixir. That sounds interesting. And then we can do some, some things about it. So if you want to get into more detail, come tomorrow to the workshop. So a little bit about me. That's me. Um, I have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. So when I say things incorrectly, you can tweet angrily at this um, handle. I helped organize something called ROSConf, which is Ruby Open Source Software Conference in Berlin and in Vienna. Um, I'd like to do more at some point. Um, it's a conference where maintainers of big time Ruby projects like um, Rails or Bundler come and give talks in the morning. And then for the whole afternoon, we do a hackathon. So you get to sit next to your like Ruby heroes and, and ha like work on their source code. You can like add contr contributions to Ruby or Bundler. It's, it's pretty neat, and the, whole, the goal of it is to spread it around the world. So if you want to organize your own ROSConf, um, talk to me, and we can talk about how you can do that. Um, I am very trendy, and I create chatbots now. So if you uh, want to talk about chatbots, that's what we can do. So first off, I'm going to hit Golang. Um, Golang was created by a company called Google, and they created it to solve some really googly problems. So one of the biggest problems at Google was developer productivity. So they wanted a programming language that could be more productive. Um, header files in C++, so including files. They were including a bunch of files they didn't need, and compile times were going through the roof. Um, the, the class system for Java and C++, which is their main kind of programming languages they were using before, was just too hefty. You had to do a lot of boilerplate. It just wasn't fun. Um, they, want, they wanted garbage collection, um, which goes back to point one with developer productivity. So, but most of the system languages don't have them. And they're also concerned with the whole multi-core thing that's happening. So some of the features, the ways that they solve this is compilation is, is crazy fast. They do a lot of caching. Um, the dependency model, including packages, is easy. If you use a package, or if you import a package, you have to use it, or the compiler freaks out. So you don't have those importing things that you don't use problems, like C++ did. Um, the static type system doesn't get in your way as much. It's there. It helps you. The compiler saves your life a lot. You have to write a lot, a lot less tests, but you don't have to write a bunch of crappy boilerplate code. Um, it has a garbage collector. And there's a lot of, like, the, the concurrency model is part of the, the language, and it feels good once you understand it. Um, there's also a lot of object-oriented programming kinds of ideas in Go. You, um, you can hide things from outside of your package by making the, their names lowercase. You have this, this or self. It looks a lot more similar to something like Python than to Ruby, where you kind of put it in as, as a kind of argument, and then you can refer to it as, as a, in a method. You have struct constructors, um, methods on structs, mixins, and interfaces, which are really, really pretty cool, and they allow you to do things like duct typing in a statically typed language. It's really very powerful, that guy. Um, so I'm going to show you some stuff. This is what I meant by, I'm probably going to just, your, my back will be to you. Um, so I'm going to show some structs. This is just a basic struct. It's simple. It's uh, a struct is a combination of kind of state and behavior. It's just it's a very very similar to a class. And this one has a a string attribute called name and then favorite. I can just probably look here and you can see it, huh? Um, favorite gems, which is a slice of string. So it's very similar to an array. Here is a method, a struct method, that. You can see here, this is what I meant by self. When you add a method to a, to a struct, you don't do it in the, in the struct definition. You do it near it. And blah, blah, blah. Actually, I already have an arrow. I don't need this thing. Um, this is, so you're referring to self as r in this case. Here is the name of the function. They sometimes take arguments. I guess I didn't feel like giving arguments in this example, because that would be a good idea. Um, this we're using an exter uh, a part of the standard library, uh, a package called Fumpt, which is actually called that, and it's fun to say every time. We're using printf, which just prints something to um, standard out in this case. 
And this is the strings package. We're using join, which joins a string on commas and a space, just like you would do that with an array in Ruby with join as well, right? Every application that you're running needs to have, a, in the main package, a main function that doesn't take any crazy arguments, like in C. And I'm creating a slice with these things. These are my favorite gems. Are they anyone else's favorite gems? Someone? One guy? Anyone? No one. Everyone has different faves. What's your favorite? Cool. All right. Um, and then I'm creating this, this struct, and then I'm calling the method on it. It's just dot notation like you're used to. So the Go concurrency patterns, normally you're using Go routines, which is like s um, just running a function in another kind of thread, like outside of the, the line of where you're processing things. And then a channel is something that you can pass to these Go routines that can send you values back over kind of like a, like a pipe, like a Unix pipe. It's very similar to that. But they're typed, so I can, I can have an int channel. I can have a, a user, if I have a user struct, a user channel that only takes that type of thing. Here is a, another crappy example. If you want to see a really good example, you should come to the workshop tomorrow. This is I'm creating a, a channel that takes strings. It's called messages. And then I immediately have this function shoot into the background, and it will automatically go below that, that function because this is happening in the background. So what's happening is really something you would definitely do in your code, is have uh, it sleep in the background for one second, and then that messages ping, is it we have an arrow? The messages ping sends a string of, of ping back into the channel, or into the channel, not back into it. So this would just blah, blah, blah. It would sit there. It would, it would wait in the background. And then what happens is if you try and pull out of a channel that doesn't have anything in it yet, it will block on it. So this will sit and wait for one second. It'll be messages will happen. It'll go straight down. It'll print blocking on channel. It'll block. And then after one second, it will pull that out, assign it to um, message. Yeah, I'm going into too much detail. So a practical use case, if you want to start using Go today, um, is something like if you're using Sidekick for a job processing queue, you can actually make your workers in Go. So you can push these jobs from Ruby, from your Rails app maybe, and then process them with Go. Um, here's a, here's a, a project that, that is that. It knows Sidekick's API. Um, to use it, you would create a worker, and your worker would have different functions that were your, your job functions. Um, this is like a fake thing that would transcode a video. We have each of these functions that take jobs need to take something that is a, a pointer to a workers.message. Um, pointers also in Go aren't difficult. They, they're, they're much more straightforward than, for example, in C. Um, I had trouble understanding pointers for a while, but with Go it was just like, okay, cool, I get it, makes sense. Um, so don't be afraid of the, the star there. So we're taking the, the arguments, we're turning it into a map, which is like a hash in Ruby, and then we are just sending that stuff through. So super simple. If you needed to transcode videos, you could just probably copy-paste this code, really. Um, here's another one with sending mail, same API, same difference. In our main function, we would start, we would configure it. If you're, if you're, sim if you're used to uh, Redis, you can see that that's Redis's normal port our default port, and you're just setting up your, your worker processor. And then we have these workers. We say we give it a, a queue name of emails, and we say this is the function that you're going to call when you get new jobs for that. And the concurrency is of 10. So 10 of those things will be picking up jobs at the same time, and then 20 with the other one. You have a stat server. You can see that that's being run in a Go routine, so it's being run in the background. Um, that's like if you've ever used Sidekick or Rescue, there's this web interface. Um, you get that with this as well, and then you just run it, and it blocks and runs for forever, for eternity. And I have arrows in case you want to see things specifically. So it turns out I actually don't love Go, but I really like it. I think it's like a really good tool. I reach for it sometimes, and it, it solves those problems of like low memory and fast and... Um, it's really nice. I really I like that there's a binary, too. It makes me happy that I just have this one file, and I'm like, oh, I can just use this file. It makes me happy. So goes nice. Um, next language I'll talk about is Elixir. Do we have any idea on time? Perfect. So 
Elixir is a programming language that runs on the Erlang VM. Um, Erlang is a programming language that was created in the 80s to solve a very specific problem um, where it was created at, uh, at Ericsson, and they needed a programming language that could program their, that could run their, their telephone switches. So if I call Ben, and then you call Joan, or whoever, I don't know, what's a common name here? Jonan, Jonan, cool. <laughs> this guy over here. Um, you call Jonan. You don't want to not be able to connect to Jonan because I'm talking to Ben. So you want those things to happen in parallel. Also, if mine and Ben's phone call explodes somehow, I don't, I don't know how it would happen. Um, you don't want the, all of the other phone calls that are happening to also end. So they needed these kinds of problems. And if you need to solve these kinds of problems, if you want to watch an awesome movie, um, just look on YouTube for the Erlang movie, and they actually act out what I just described, but not with Ben um, or Jonas. And it's, it's wonderful. There's also Erlang movie two, where um, it's maybe even more wonderful, and they might poke some fun at Node.js and Ruby a little bit. It's good, good times. So um, I Elixir was, was created by Jose Valim of Rails and, and, and what else? Um, devise, other stuff. What's the one where you don't have to do anything in your controller? What's that one? Inherited resources. Uh, but he's, uh, he's done a lot of, he's, he's around. You've probably heard of him. He, he created the programming language because he, he, he really liked Erlang, but he wanted kind of something a little bit more modern, something that had a more consistent syntax, better tooling, um, better documentation, all of these things. So he's like, well, build my own. Okay. And so the features of Elixir are, it's, it's a functional programming language. So that's kind of like the biggest difference in any of these programming languages. Like this whole concept is, is quite different, but you pick it up pretty fast. It's, it's kind of Ruby-like. The syntax is similar to Ruby. You look at it, you'll be able to understand it, most of it right away. Um, there, everything kind of runs in its own process. Concurrency just kind of comes with the programming language. You don't really have, you, you have to think about it, but you don't have to, it, it doesn't feel bolted on. It's, it's there. It's just always there. Um, there's, a, a, they're, they're really interested in um, fault tolerance. They want things to just crash. Um, instead of doing complicated error handling. And the REPL is awesome, the, and it comes with a lot of, like, the standard library is great, and the tooling is fantastic. So as, as far as it being a functional programming language, um, there's no shared immut immutable state anywhere. If you have, like, a struct, they have structs as well, and you want to change the name, maybe, that's an attribute, you would have to create a whole new struct. So you're always passing around new values. The, the um, runtime itself does things, like if you have a giant map and you need to just change one thing in it, um, the compiler will, or the, sorry, the runtime will do things to just pick out part of that and copy it over. So it's, it looks to you like it's immutable, but it's not in the real world, just, world just to be more efficient. Um, but it's, it's pretty fun. Like it, I was, I was surprised by how fun it was to just like, oh, I need this new thing. I just put a, I copy it and I, I return this other. Like it's, I, I don't know why I got so into it, but I love it. Um, concurrency is a first class thing. Um, it uses the actor pattern, so you create multiple processes, and then you send these processes messages. So it's very similar to like the uh, the small talk kind of definition of object oriented programming, where you have these classes where you have instances of them that are objects, and then you're constantly sending these objects messages. It's similar to that, but it's this whole concurrent world of processes that you're sending messages, and those messages end up in their, their mailbox. They call it a mailbox. Um, you refer to the process by the process ID. Uh, you send anything to it, any kind of value, and then it listens and tries to do things with those. And then you can send it the main process's PID to be able to talk back. So you're like, Tell me everyone when you're done so I know that I can move on is one thing, one pattern that you can use. Um, because of this concurrency pattern, years ago, WhatsApp was able to do one something million, one million, yeah, a little over one million open connections on kind of a su somewhat beefy server. Um, and then the next year they did 2.2 million, 2012. I don't know what they're at now. Does anyone have any idea? Something? 50 billion we have, one. So um, it's, it's also very fault tolerant. Um, 
so I'm going to actually try and do this. I'm probably going to screw everything up, but I'm going to try and show you a supervisor tree. Um, so I'm going to do this, and that's really big and weird. Um, okay, oops, this is some stuff here. I should probably cleared it before I, I showed it to you. So you can start up your... Um, I'm good at typing. And I actually can't see the thing that I need to see right now. This is not awesome. Can I make it smaller? There we go. OK, so this is our supervision tree right here. This is a process that's running that our, that our Elixir logger watcher, which is a supervisor, is watching. Um, and this Elixir logger supervisor is watching this Elixir logger watcher. <laughs> watcher. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to kill this process. You can see right now that its, it's process ID is 0 0.108. We kill it, and then we get a new one. So this guy is saying, hey, um, restart. That's what this supervisor's job is. We're going to kill this guy now, see what happens. And we can see that we get a new process down here, which means this guy started new too. So now we're going to go to you, and what are you going to do? you were going to say, I don't know how to deal with this error, so I'm going to blow the whole application up. So this is kind of just like looking directly into the supervisors. And with, with Elixir, with Erlang, it makes it really, really easy to, to set up this hierarchy. You don't have to really think about it. And it's well tested, and there's lots of different choices of, should I kill everything? Should I just restart it? Right out of the box. It's good stuff. Um, pattern matching, I'm going to try this again. How much time do I have? Okay. So um, normally you would have something like x equals 2. Um, in Elixir, you're not just assigning it. You're also matching. So I can do 2 equals x, and it's also 2. But if I try and do 3 equals x, it gives me a match error, because these two things do not match. You can also do things like create a list. I don't know why it needs to be four things. And then you can do things like destructure that list. So I'm going to grab the head and the tail, and I'm going to call them h and tail. It's going to assign those variables equals list. So now h, tail, and then list is the same, because we didn't mutate anything. Um, and then you can do other things like take deep nested maps and also match on something that's deep. Like you need a location, latitude, and longitude inside this big thing. You can do that really easily. I'm not going to show that right now. So let's look at some, some, some code. We got a, a module here. Um, a module has functions in it. If you have this, you have this def, it looks a lot like Ruby, but you have a do. Um, what's happening here? This p means private, so you can't access that from outside of the, of the module. Um, and you just do dot notation here. You call the module name, and they're all functions, function time. So here we're creating a struct. Um, it's a struct. You have to have a module, and then define the struct inside of the module, and then you call that with a, you create that with a, a percent sign, and that's just something, and you get dot notation into username and email as well. Um, here we have something a little bit more complicated. It's a shape module with an area function. Um, you can do multiple, you can do m function overloading. So you get, what's happening? Actually, I have arrows, don't I? I love arrows. So both of these are called area, but they take a different kind of argument. Um, this one takes something called a tuple. A tuple is just a list of things. Generally, you want to keep it, they say, under four, under five things, under five things, I think. Um, and we're pattern matching on that. So we're saying, if we get a tuple with an atom, an atom is like a symbol in Ruby, an atom with the name like called rectangle, um, we're going to, and it's three items long, we're going to assign W to the second thing and H to the third thing. And then we're going to multiply those together. Um, here, we're doing this, a similar thing, but we're saying the, the atom needs to be circle, and it has to be two elements long, and we're going to assign r radius to the second thing, and then we're calling out to Elixir, or sorry, to Erlang, 
um, to do the calculations. And you can see that it works here in these two, and then the third one we're calling um, area with a with a tuple with three things that start with circle, and we don't have a definition for that, so it tells us we have a match error. Um, something that's really interesting that, they're that, that you can use in Elixir is the Phoenix framework. It's, um, very, it's, it's, it's quite similar to Rails. If you're used to Rails, you can pick it up really quickly. The router looks like a Rails router. You have this um, get. You can also use something called resources, which is just like resources in Rails. This would look for the page controller uh, module the index action on it. Um, you can pipe through these different things. Here we have the browser pipeline, which turns it into an HTML accepts header and does some of these other things, like gives you a session and gives you a flash. Um, and you can also create other pipelines, like API, which would um, up there, it accepts JSON. That's all that it does. So in the controller, you have, um, looks very similar to Rails, but you get two arguments. One thing is the, the connection. The other thing is like your params object in, in a Rails controller. Um, here is a more complicated one. We're pattern matching on the, um, on the product ID to just, because that's all we care about in the params hash. And then we're using Ecto, which is kind of not at all like Active Record, but it would play the Active Record m role in a Phoenix app um, to grab a product out by product ID. And then we're giving it this, um, we're, we're rendering this template and we're sending in the local variable product that's our product. So there's a lot more things to look at. We might be able to look at some of that in, um, in the workshop if you come. OK, perfect. Um, and the last language I'm getting to is the Crystal programming language. So Crystal is kind of the, the new programming language on the block. It's, um, it was created to solve some problems that the, the creators had with Ruby. So um, they wanted more like compiler time error checks. Ruby is sometimes considered to be sort of slow. So they were like, OK, let's make it faster. Um, but some people are okay with Ruby speed. Um, it's, Ruby uses a lot of memory. They wanted to make it more efficient that way. Um, and Trump won. So Crystal's goals are to, to be as Ruby-like as, as possible, as they possibly can, while still making things efficient and work and good. Um, they, it's statically typed, but they don't want it you to have to tell which type it is when you're making a method definition. So it's kind of like optional static typing on method definitions. They have this really nice FFI-like C um, compatibility layer where it just like, it, you're just like, I want to use this C function. OK, cool, and it just works. Um, and the, there's a lot of code that doesn't need to be generated by you. It's very, it's fast. I don't know how many times faster than Ruby it is, depending on the problem, of course, but it can be, I don't know, four, eight, 100,000 times faster. Um, and it uses a lot less memory, which is awesome. So you can do method overloading like you just saw in Elixir. The, um, the, it's, it's very similar to Go's concurrency patterns with spawn instead of uh, um, Go and channels. There is static typing. If you like that, I dig it. I like that I don't have to do it also. Um, we already said that. So here's some Ruby code. It's really simple, basic class. So we're going to run that with the Crystal compiler. I'm going to wait because I'm fast at typing. And it just, Crystal will run your Ruby code. You can just, all of your Ruby code, just put it through the Crystal compiler. That's actually not going to work at all. but. So Kamal is like, it's a, it's a project that's like Sinatra. Um, here's a whole chat server that's written in Kamal <coughs> that uses WebSockets. Um, this is the whole chat server. I mean, that there's a front end like React app too, but this is all the code. This is what it looks like when you run that code. Everything takes a long time right now. So yeah, chat server, basic. Um, and just everything. Your life will change. Everything is easier with Crystal. You should just throw Ruby away and start using Crystal today. You actually probably um, shouldn't. But if you do want to start with it, you can. St the, the guy who wrote Sidekick created a Crystal 
client for it, like the Go client that you saw earlier. Um, and you can start using Crystal today. And it's really like you will have to change the code, not very much at all. So it's very alpha. Um, it says so one of the first things on the site. So play with it, look at it. It's cool, um, but I'd wait. Yeah, and an, an, animations. So um, the Ruby community likes to say uh, minus one. Uh, min, uh, m m Matt's is nice, and so we're nice. But I think that uh, the new thing should be because Matt's donates to Crystal, and so we donate to Crystal. Um, there he is again. So I really love Ruby, um, but I'm kind of trying to see it more as a tool than as um, something that I feel like is my identity. Um, and learning these other things is helping with that a lot. If you want to learn any of these programming languages better, you should check out exorcism.io. Um, it's a site where they give you a bunch of tests and a problem, like a problem like count down 99 bottles of beer. Um, and then you get these tests to pass, and then you get to move on to the next thing. The other thing that's cool is that other people who are great at the programming language or whatever you're using can look at your code and tell you where you could maybe make it more efficient or nicer or more idiomatic. So check it out. It's awesome. And thank you very much. Um, QR codes are coming back. So snap them up with your QR code. Re there we go. I see some people QR coding. Um, and yeah, thanks. And peace.